Wahigri Ji Ka Khalsa, Wahigri Ji Ki Fateh. On behalf of the Gurdwara, I would like to welcome each and every one of you uh, to this uh, place of worship. I, it's difficult to follow an introduction like that, particularly from your sibling. Uh, but I uh, take each word that she's given me, uh, and I'll take that to heart, because you never know if she'll ever actually speak that highly of me again in public. <laughs> Adversity is a seemingly simple word, but a word that has a great deal of complexity when we pull and peel the layers back and look at what adversity really means to the individual. And so for a teenager, adversity may in fact mean dealing with the bullying that they have to face in school every day. For a single mother, adversity might mean having to face the challenges of how to put food on the table. Adversity for someone that lives in a, what we call a third world country might mean simply being able to pull enough money together for that day's meal. Or for a child soldier, dealing with the chaos and madness and trying to negotiate your way through life in a world created by people who don't seem to understand or have lost their way in terms of recognizing the fundamental connectedness that we all have. For Guru Nanak, the founder of Sikhism, adversity meant all of those things and much more. Born in the late 1400s in the northern part of India, Guru Nanak lived during a time when Martin Luther was dealing with all of the changes and his own conflicts with the church in Europe, when Columbus was sailing the ocean blue in search of a great brand new world. And during this time, Guru Nanak looked around him and in a world where he saw women that simply having been born a female were relegated to a life of misery. A child whose only crime was that she was born a baby girl, killed in her infancy when she was barely days old. Or a young man relegated to a lifetime of servitude simply because he happened to be born in what was called an untouchable or lower caste. This was the adversity that Guru Nanak saw and when he saw that adversity, he came to one realization. And that was victim or perpetrator, Nanik Dukya Sab Sansar. Nanik, the entire world is in pain. And so when he looked at this, Guru Nanik's journey began much like ours, in search of having to find or figuring out what it means, where does this adversity come from? Where does this experience of pain come from? And when Guru Nanak looked at the actions of others, when Guru Nanak looked at the actions of his fellow human beings, his neighbors, his brothers, his sisters, what he realized was that adversity was all man-created, human-created, created by us. For Mother Earth had provided us with abundance. Mother Earth had provided enough food to feed all of us. There were no boundaries in Mother Earth based on linguistic grounds, based on cultural grounds, based on racial or religious grounds. These were simply man-made concepts, ideas and ideologies perpetrated by people over centuries and centuries but to what end? And for what purpose? What reason? And when Guru Nanak peeled the layers back a little bit further, the reason he came up with was very simple. That most of us see the world in a duality. Myself versus the other. Someone who is outside of myself. Me, mine, and I, you, or them. And the myself and the them, when they come into conflict, often resulted in people creating rules and laws and boundaries 
created primarily to serve their own ends, their own personal ends, whether it was religious rules or laws, social rules or laws, customs. These were all generally created to perpetuate some form of status quo because someone somewhere in power felt the necessity to hold on to that power. And so me was much more important than you. And when Guru Nanak saw that duality, the answer that he came up with to resolve the problems caused by humanity, to deal with adversity, was a really simple solution. A fundamental recognition and understanding that there is only one being. And we are part of that one being, a part of that one reality. And so it is with that in mind that the Guru Granth Sahib, the six scriptures, begin with the number one. Ik Onkar. There is one reality, one being. Seemingly simple, but fundamentally profound concept. Because if there is only one being, if there is only one reality, if there is only one, then the two, the three, the four, the 50 that I see before me are simply artificial constructs created by man. And so perhaps if I erase those artificial constructs that are created by me in my mind, I will no longer treat people differently. When you bleed, I will feel the pain. When you cry, I will feel your sorrow. When you hurt, I will be there to pick you up because your pain, your hurt, your sorrow, your blood is no different than mine. That was Guru Nanak's vision. And I know that over the past six months, under the direction of the Multi-Phase Action Society, we have also learned that that was the vision of all of the profound spiritual teachers of each of the faith traditions that each of us has been so honored to be a part of. And that is what is so amazing about this journey that we embarked on six months ago, but also the journey that Guru Nanak embarked on 500 plus years ago. And so beginning with that basic concept of ik onkar, there is one being, one reality, Gunanik realized that for transformation and change to happen, it wasn't simply enough to have a talk, to say words, but you needed to walk the talk. So how to walk the talk of a oneness with humanity? Simple. His best friend was a Muslim. And he had another best friend that was a Hindu. He himself was born in a Hindu family. And yet, what he challenged was the rigid structures that every single religion inevitably falls prey to when human beings become the reason and the be-all for that religious institution to exist. When we put the divine lower than the institution that was designed to help us reach the divine, it's at that point in time that adversity begins. For we all know that many of the challenges that are faced in the modern world and that were faced in the past were challenges often created by religion, often created by religious institutions. And so Guru Nanak's challenge was not a challenge to religion or spirituality or spiritual practice, but a challenge to structures that were designed to exist in and of themselves. But most importantly, a challenge to the self, a challenge to himself. For even in all of the scriptural writings that Guru Nanak wrote, he always spoke to himself. It was never, you are bad, you do this, but Nanak, realize this, recognize this, understand this, a lecture to the self. And that is how a Sikh deals with adversity. First and foremost, for a Sikh, addressing adversity is really about reforming the self, about looking inward rather than outward. 
and understanding what I am on the inside. And when I can experience and feel and understand my innermost energy, I begin to see that same energy, that same light emanating outside of me, connecting me to the rest of the world. And so Guru Nanak then set up practices to put into place the words to walk the talk. And so a Sikh wears a turban. And the purpose of that turban is very simple. It is a recognition of the humility that a Sikh should have every day. A recognition that the divine energy is everywhere and is present everywhere. But it comes from a social practice where women were forced to cover their faces in the presence of men. And in that social practice which Guru Nanak abhorred, he understood intuitively that a woman's humility that she had was forced to show by society was a humility that a man also needed to show and live and embody. And although the veil of the woman was lifted, at the same time, the man covered his head to bring himself at the same level of the female, to understand that he was not higher than her, that both of them, by covering their heads out of deference and respect, were not covering their heads out of deference and respect to people, but rather to the spiritual creative energy, the divine essence, inside and outside all of us. And so a sick woman will never cover her face. A sick woman will never kill her baby daughter. A sick woman will stand up against injustice, but so too will a sick man. And so it was that even in Montreal, when a young Muslim woman wanted to wear the niqab in order to go out in public, but was not provided with access to public facilities, government facilities because she wore the niqab. It was therefore that the World Sikh Organization in understanding and recognizing the path and the journey that is required and mandated for a Sikh stepped forward and said, even though fundamentally we don't believe that a woman should veil her face in public, we will protect your right to do so. We will protect your right to be able to freely practice your belief. Yet how ironic that the kirpan that they wore, which for a Sikh signifies our obligation to stand up against injustice, signifies the requirement for a Sikh to always speak for those that cannot speak for themselves, became the very reason that this delegation of four Sikhs from the World Sikh Organization were unable to even attend the building to make the presentation in support of this young Muslim woman and all Muslim women in Canada. Ironic, but yet that is life. Adversity, of course. But it is through adversity that we become stronger. It is through adversity that we learn who we truly are because it is not the good times that create us and form us and shape us. It is our ability to go through difficult challenges and to come through stronger and with a profound sense of who we are and a stronger sense of our own identity. And thus it is that a Sikh lives and embodies and is required to articles of faith that reflect those values, the oneness of the creator, never ending, never dying, and my wearing of it on my right hand, my recognition that every time I lift my hand, it will be to do good for others. It will not be for selfish for me, but for you. My kirpan to stand up against injustice. My kashada, my cotton breeches or underwear that re so represents for me my integrity. My commitment to myself first and foremost, but also my commitment to others. My ganga, which is my reminder as I comb my hair every day with this wooden comb that I am cleansing my mind, clearing it of negative thoughts and clearing it of this separateness, understanding and recognizing that by combing my hair, I'm breaking down these boundaries that differentiate me with the other and covering my uncut hair, understanding that what God has created me, 
A woman with long flowing hair or a man with a long flowing beard is something so profoundly beautiful that I don't need to change this irrespective of the fashion trends of the time, that this is the one thing that becomes my life jacket in a chaotic world, a world that mandates that a woman should change her appearance every time she has and is faced with people in different peer groups, or a man should change what he looks like or who he is in order to fit in. And these articles of faith that a sick wears, that have become the embodiment of a sick vision are designed not only for me to be able to face my own challenges, but more importantly, to help me learn and rise above adversity. And it's so with that in mind that I hope that each of you this evening will get an opportunity to learn about the challenges faced by other faith traditions, but fundamentally to understand that at its core, each of our traditions teaches us the exact same things. We simply live and embody them in different ways. Thank you so much for coming here this evening. Wahegrujika Khalsa, Wahegrujiki Fateh.